Hello and welcome back to the third installment of our motherboard restoration series, featuring the iconic ASUS P2B. Thus far, we have successfully revived two motherboards, updated the BIOS and got them up and running with Windows. If you're just joining for today's episode, I suggest you start from the beginning, to catch up on the journey so far. Today, we will focus on the third motherboard, which shares quite a few similarities with the previous motherboard, notably its badly corroded ASUS chip. Initially, I anticipated this board to be a simpler fix compared to the last one. But as it turns out, my assumption was quite off as we will see in this video. While the corrosion on this board didn't seem as advanced at first glance, I quickly got my reality check when I confidently scratched the crust off the ASUS chip with tweezers. And here we are, facing a challenge I haven't anticipated. The pins on the ASUS chip are far more fragile than expected, with one already broken. While I had my doubts about using the engraving pen, fearing it might cause further damage, I found it to be a more controllable alternative to remove as much corrosion as possible. Let's watch together how the engraving pen takes large chunks of corrosion away, leaving behind bare copper legs. Now that we have cleared most of the corrosion, it is time to get the ASUS chip off the board. I'm using low melt solder, a safer alternative to hot air in my opinion, especially with plastic connectors nearby. Unfortunately, the corroded metal proves resistant to bonding with the fresh solder, likely due to surface oxidation. 
the low melt solder struggles to mix and attach to the ASUS chip. But eventually, the heat, flux and low melt solder break the connection and we can finally lift the ASUS chip from the board. Before we can put this chip back on the board, I have to clean its legs thoroughly. The goal is to remove any visible corrosion and cover the legs with a fresh solder layer. While I remove the ASUS IC, another leg snapped in the middle. Something we have to worry about once we re-solder the chip. Before we continue with removing the solder mask above discolored traces and wires, let me quickly talk about corroded solder joints on SMD components. As mentioned before, corrosion causes solder to lose its ability to melt properly. I do not know if such joints still have good electrical properties, but I believe those connections will fail eventually. In areas like this, I prefer to remove the corrosion and replace all affected components. I would not recommend reusing components like caps or resistors. You would have to clean each component properly to ensure solder attaches to the contacts. And then you have to worry if they operate within specification. There is also a chance that you will rip off a contact terminal like I did on this last capacitor. For cheap and common components like this, it is much easier to replace them with new ones. Since the components on this board are unreliable, I will measure their values on another P2B without corrosion in that area. Of course, I have to desolder them from the circuit to get an accurate reading using a multimeter. I did this off camera since we have a much more exciting topic to cover. But first, a quick shout out to PCBWay, the sponsor of today's video. If you like to tinker with electronic projects like I do, then you may be in need of printed circuit boards. PCBWay is the ideal partner to turn your ideas into reality. With PCBWay's assembly service, you may not even need to touch a soldering iron. And if you feel that single color PCBs are too boring for your projects, you can order full color PCBs with your custom designs to stand out from the crowd. PCBWay also currently hosts the KeyCAD design contest for those of you who would like to compete and showcase your creative ideas and technical skills. You still have until the 2nd of June to submit your project. Visit pcbway.com to get more information and explore their other services. Links are in the video description. After my last video, I got a few comments questioning my ability to remove corrosion inside vias. And it is true that when I remove the corrosion and leave the area untreated and exposed, chances are that within a couple of days, the corrosion is back. Here is what I do to prevent corrosion from reappearing. First, I use vinegar while grinding away the surface. The engraving pen causes the vinegar to circulate, which helps to remove debris from the area I'm working on. Once most corrosion is gone, I use fine tweezers to get into the wires and scratch out as much of the green gunk as possible. Of course, this won't be perfect, but the vinegar will help to neutralize the remaining corrosion. After that, I will dry the vinegar and apply fresh solder immediately. And as a last step, I seal any exposed copper with solder mask to prevent oxygen from facilitating corrosion again. I can't tell if this fix will last forever, but we can revisit one of those fixed boards in a couple of weeks to see if corrosion reappeared. So what about removing solder mask above traces and wires? Well, since you have seen me do this in both previous videos, I won't spend time on this today. But just to let you know, removing the solder mask on this board took around 70% of the time I spent on this board overall. In a way, it was very similar to board number 2. Instead, let's get the ASUS chip back on the board. Before I could do that however, I had to fix 4 pads below the chip that connect to broken wires. Another indicator that the corrosion on this board was a bit more severe than on the previous boards. Thin copper wires with a diameter of 0.1mm fit perfectly through those wires. On the other side of the board, we can then re-establish the connection with the corresponding traces. And solder mask will keep the copper wires in place.
Finally, the board is ready and can be tested. Even though it was a challenge to get the ASUS chip with its two broken legs back on the board, I am very confident that we will have another working P2B. Instead of using the Pentium 2 with a heavy heatsink, we will use a Pentium 3 500 since the board doesn't have retention clips installed. Board number 3. And... Ah, uh, not again. I was very suspicious of not getting a postcode from the post analyzer card. Do we have a contact issue between the board and the CPU again? Huh? <sighs> Changing the Pentium 3 for the Pentium 2 brought a slight improvement. At least a sign of life. One postcode appeared, but that is all. The board still does not continue to boot. Those boards were probably in storage for many years and there may be some non-conductive buildup on the contacts. Even though there is no corrosion inside the slot 1 connector, it is better to clean it using a contact cleaner and then try again. And board number 3 is alive. This will bring the score to 3 revivals of 3 tries. Similar to the previous boards, the BIOS is at version 1006 and needs to be updated with our modified version of the latest BIOS. If you want to know more about a simple way to get more from your board BIOSes, check out the video of restoring motherboard number 2 or watch my video about BIOS patcher. Version 1014 detects Pentium 3 models properly. However, there is still a lot to do on this board. For instance, I need to decide what to do with these ISA slots. Treat or replace them? Maybe we should compare a few contact cleaners, vinegar and citric acid to see what happens under the microscope. Let me know in the comments if that would interest you. But now let's get to the exciting part. Our third P2B is working, but as you can tell from its name, it is a motherboard designed for the Pentium 2. Desktop models for the Pentium 2 require 2.8V for early 350nm models and 2V for later ones manufactured using a 250nm process. The ASUS P2B can deliver those voltages with ease. If we look at the board between the serial ports and the slot 1 connector, we can spot a chip with the designation HIP6019CB. This advanced dual PWM and dual linear power control chip can control voltages between 1.8 and 3.5V. This is perfect for the Pentium 2 and even certain Pentium 3 CPUs. But if you have a copper mine CPU, you're out of luck. You can still install slot 1 copper mines or their socket 370 version using an adapter, but the board will not post if the power delivery circuit senses that it cannot deliver the 1.75V requested by the CPU. That reduces the selection of processors we can use on the ASUS P2B quite a bit. There is a workaround however. Adapters exist that allow the use of PGA370 CPUs on slot 1 motherboards. Some of those adapters can override the CPU voltage by setting a few jumpers or dip switches. Unfortunately, those adapters are not that common. But if you're the lucky owner of one, you can override the CPU core voltage to 1.8V, the lowest voltage the ASUS P2B can deliver. It is very close to the stock voltage of this Coppermine 1000 and shouldn't cause any major problems. With the adapter configured for 1.8V, we can get the P2B to boot and even display the correct CPU model, thanks to the latest BIOS we flashed a few moments ago. Even though this workaround seems to be a nifty trick to get Coppermine CPUs to work on P2B motherboards, there are a few caveats. First, at 1.8V, we overvolt the CPU, which will result in slightly higher temperatures. Second, because we run the CPU slightly above the required voltage, the voltage monitor in the BIOS shows an error occasionally. If the BIOS monitors the core voltage, the boot process is paused to inform you that something is wrong. And third, you will be out of luck if you have a proper slot 1 CPU like this one, which requests an even lower core voltage of 1.7V. Without jumpers to manually set the voltage, this Pentium 3 1000 will never work on this motherboard. Or will it? 
Based on a Vogons thread, we could replace the power control chip with a pin compatible version that supports voltages down to 1.3 volts. This chip with the designation HIP6019BCB should allow us to use any Coppermine CPU on this board, regardless of their voltage requirements. Provided that the ASUS board is compatible with this new chip. Could it really be that by replacing this chip, you could have kept your P2B motherboard in service, saved a couple of hundred dollars and made the P3B somewhat unnecessary for you? I guess we will find out very soon. Let's replace that chip and see if we can reproduce what Rockstar Runner documented on Vogons. Of course, I couldn't wait to test this mod. I will use the slot 1 Pentium 3 1000, which requests a core voltage of 1.7 volts. Yes! And the Coppermine Pentium 3 1000 posts on the ASUS P2B. Board number 3 is now compatible with every Coppermine in existence. And in the BIOS, the CPU core voltage is reported at 1.7 volts, without errors. The boot process continues now without interruption, as if the board always supported this CPU. But then I was curious what would happen if we installed this Pentium 3 on board number 2. I'd expect that we would get no activity when we power up the system. And indeed, no postcodes appear. So the mod was successful, making board number 3 the only board in my batch compatible with Coppermine Pentium 3s. CPU-C reports a core voltage close to 1.7 volts, exactly what we would expect. I find it fascinating when I stumble upon information like this when I prepare for topics and new video ideas. And maybe this power control chip swap is suitable for other motherboard models as well. 
So, what do you think about the restoration of board number 3? Were you surprised to see the ASUS chip in such bad condition? And let me know what you think about the mod to make the P2B Coppermine compatible. Imagine, you could have modded your board back in the day and get copper mines working on it. Would you have done a chip swap? Or would you have preferred to spend a couple of hundred dollars to get a motherboard designed for the Pentium 3? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. I will continue now to apply solder mask making sure to cover any remaining exposed traces. And then I will get to work on board number 4. I also have more information about the fake motherboards which we will look at in the coming video. So I hope you're looking forward to motherboard number 4. And with this we have reached the end of today's video. A big shout out to all my Patreons and PCBWay for sponsoring my content. Thanks for watching and I will see you in one of my other videos.